Okay, I expect a few more people will join, uh, but here we go. So uh, I'm Maurice Shank. I'm the CEO of Learnershape. We've been running this LearnTech meetup series for a few years. We haven't done any uh, in a while. Uh, Learn Learnershape has had our head down building AI-enabled edtech applications. And we've decided to relaunch this to uh, talk about AI safety, including because I've gotten quite interested in AI safety um, through a website that we've been building called SciHub, the Safe and Responsible AI Information Hub. And, uh, and I met Sue, who's a fantastic course leader and master's graduate at Northeastern University, who was keen to do this presentation on AI safety. So uh, just a few words about SciHub. Uh, SciHub, you can check it out at SciHub.info. Two important uh, principles of our site. One is that we believe in the promise of AI. So safety is not about pre preventing AI from happening. It's about figuring out like airplanes. We like airplanes in flight, but we still have to make sure they're safe. Same thing we believe about AI. And second, we believe that there's a lot of different risks and harms of AI that should be considered. Existential risk that the robots are all going to come to get us. Well, maybe. Uh, bias at the other end of the spectrum. We know it happens, but we need to control it. There's a lot of others, and we categorize them on the site. And you'll see that reflected in this presentation. Uh, with that, I'll just say that uh, if you have questions, we'd like you to put them in the chat. We're going to try to leave some time at the end. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Sue. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you so much, Maury, and thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm going to attempt to share my screen now. Um, so please let me know, Maury, if you can see that. Yes. All right. Oh, sorry. One second. Let me refresh that really quick. Um, all right, I'm not going to have a view of the participants. So like Maury said, please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. And at the end, I'll try to leave a bit of time for a QA. and a um, And I'll really quickly share. All right. Everybody can see that? All right, perfect. So thank you all for joining. Um, we are going to try to cover a lot of material here. So I will be pacing through this, but this is really just barely the tip of the iceberg. Um, so we've gathered you here because uh, we believe that AI safety needs involvement from a diverse range of expertise, not just AI researchers or developers. And um, there's a lot of material out there about AI safety, but we wanted to provide sort of an overview, accessible introduction, uh, again, we're only briefly touching on things, but at the end, we want to provide you with a list of resources um, where you can sort of do your own uh, research. And please, while you uh, listen to this uh, conversation, try to think about how your unique backgrounds and skills could contribute to this field. Uh, again, we're going to cover a lot of material, so um, would love to hear that in the end. So. Who are we? Uh, we are a group of people who, uh, just like you, come probably from different non-technical backgrounds, and uh, we have then developed some kind of technical expertise to be able to work on AI safety. Uh, my focus area is currently on AI sentience and moral status, which is a really fuzzy sort of disputed area. Uh, Michaela works with psychology, ethics of emotion recognition. AI is, uh, Jennifer is with AI applications and law enforcement. Jacob does some technical research and Jem is working on entrepreneurship and AI and education. Uh, quite a diverse group. Um, so hopefully it re reflects sort of the material here. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to find out a bit more about you. Uh, how are you on the current issue at hand on a scale of one to five? Is AI safety something you're really concerned about? Um, so if you can answer in the poll, I have received a notification, I think. Um, Maury, maybe you could let me know. If yes, we've got the poll going and I see everybody should be seeing results. Um, okay, so the results are live. In the end, we'll take another temperature check just to see if intuitions have changed uh, throughout this presentation. Um, it's all right if it hasn't, but it's just good to know. Uh, we'll give one second so people can monitor the results. Maybe I'll even try to peek really quick. We have a fairly concerned group here. Most people, 
four is the winning answer. Two people have voted five. One person has voted three, and nobody's voted one or two. So, okay. I'll give it like fifteen more seconds, and then move on. Um. Anyway, I'm impatient. We'll just we'll just skip it. So. There seems to be a more concerned leaning group, which is interesting. Oftentimes when we do these kinds of presentations, it's uh, scattered all over the place, um, which kind of coincidentally reflects how expert consensus is on the matter. There's really a lack of one. Um, this is one of the largest surveys that have been done uh, across AI researchers. I think the criteria was that the researchers surveyed had to publish in the top six AI journals. Um, and amongst them, you can see that there's a range of opinion. Um, some think that it will be a very good outcome in the future for the future of human flourishing. Some really bad, which think something like existential risk is uh, possible. And then a lot of views in between. Uh, another reason why this is sort of an important topic to talk about is uh, there are a lot of really great international developments going on with regard to AI safety, especially on the governance end of it. Uh, one really exciting one was um, the Bletchley Park Summit with, with the UK, and, and, and then a couple other summits have, have then uh, taken course since. Uh, the second one was the Seoul Summit, and after the UK one, uh, a board of international experts, uh, 30 uh, across, uh, across 30 countries, 75 experts, came together uh, and decided that we need at least one really thorough document that talks about AI safety. Uh, it's quite a technical document. Uh, the main reason why they wanted it was because there were a lot of disputes about the timelines, potential large-scale impacts, and the lack of uh, scientific consensus. Uh, I would recommend it if you want to get a good overview. It's a long document. What um, I really sort of what caught my attention about the document was at the end there's a differing views section. And, and really two main important things to highlight there. Um, the document's fairly technical, but, but the impact of AI, especially the lack of AI safety, will be both a technical and a socio-technical issue. Um, we need sort of a diverse range of perspectives from education to democracy, uh, economics. And another really important one is the role of fundamental human rights assessment in trying to create a document where we talk about AI safety, which apparently was a significant omission in the current version of the report. The next one is going to be presented sometime in November, but in the meantime, um, we thought we'd put together something where we'll give people who uh, otherwise wouldn't want to sort of delve into the technical side of AI safety, a really uh, brief, very, very over, uh, high level overview of the topic. Uh, sort of go through the history of the developments and some safety breaches we're concerned about, introduce the field of AI safety um, and the different components, and give you a sort of idea of how you can get involved in the future. Uh, now, for those who have kind of a technical background, this will be uh, really, really simple and very repetitive, but there are some technical foundations we should cover before talking about the implications. Um, mainly that when we talk about AI, we're talking really about the three uh, sort of pillars. Uh, this is a really, really great one sentence summary uh, for when somebody asks about what AI or machine learning is. Um, from the Center uh, for Security for Emerging Technology, machine learning systems use computing power uh, to execute algorithms and learn from data. So really algorithms, data, and compute make up uh, what we talk about when we talk about this really umbrella term of AI. Um, most artificial intelligence applications we talk about are in the generative AI category, and they really are uh, a, a result of advanced machine learning, uh, advanced deep learning. Um, so, so a little bit I'll try to brush up on it here. Um, in the list of resources we've curated, there's a lot of sort of introduction to these concepts uh, for those who are interested in the technical parts. Um, some of the main things uh, that are worth noting are that neural networks are basically the current deep learning as the paradigm of, of, of current generative AI. And, and within that, neural networks uh, are, are what the algorithms are sort of based on. And it's modeled off of the human brain. Uh, this is a really great analogy because uh, on the left, you can see what an artificial neural network uh, looks like. And very similar to how little we know about the human brain, we know very little about the exact sort of decision-making processes that go on in the nodes or the hidden layer of the uh, of the neural networks. Um, this is what people talk about when they talk about AI being a sort of black 
black box. We have some ways to understand what's going on. Uh, but they're probabilistic ways, they're not deterministic, uh, which means that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done if we're going to have safe and secure systems. Um, one really effective method is reinforcement learning from human feedback. Uh, this sort of does two things. It gives us a bit more control about the kinds of um, outputs that you get from uh, artificial intelligence models, such as large language models that ChatGPT uh, and, and other generative models uh, use for text-based um, AI. Uh, so the, the, the very like easy overview explanation is that you give a model that's trained on a large set of data a prompt and uh, you get an output. Then a human evaluator is put into the process to rank the quality of the output um, so that uh, a reward model is trained, which is then used to sort of tune the major model. A really interesting thing I came across um, is that like the reason why we get um, sort of the random words that ChatGPT or other large language models keep repeating are because of the human evaluators. Um, this is really expensive, really hard to come by. Uh, good quality human evaluators. Most of the work is outsourced. So apparently that's something uh, that like the word delve is used a lot in Nigeria. But so that's important to keep in mind. Uh, there's there's some kind of human involvement uh, and there are some limitations of reinforcement learning from human feedback. Uh, we can talk about that more in the Q&A if we have a little bit of time. For now, we'll move on to data. So there's three different types of data that we talk about when we talk about the data that is used to train uh, AI models. The models you, uh, that we use with machine learning learn from the data, so the quality and quantity of the data directly impact the performance of those models. And for the effective models that we talk about, they're trained on a lot of data. ChatGPT is the majority of the internet. Um, so this quantity and quality of data and the fact that it directly impacts performance has a couple implications for AI safety. Uh, one is that it's really difficult to monitor the kind of data that goes into training these models. There's some work that's been done to try to maybe clean the data before um, or, or make it more interpretable so that you know kind of what's going in a bit more, uh, but it's just very hard to do. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of data there. Um, and the other one is that there's only a finite amount of human generated data. This is actually a legitimate concern that people have is that we're going to run out of human data at some point. Uh, 2024 is the projected year um, or 2040 I've seen from Epoch before. Uh, and when that happens, apparently there's some studies that show that uh, the quality of the models will also be poorly affected because of uh, sort of a decrease in the quality of the data. That's uh, a limitation. Compute is a really, really big one, especially when talking about the ethics because this has a lot of implications. Uh, current AI paradigms have uh, really benefited from an increase in computing power. This is sort of a brute way, brute force way we've gotten for, uh, to, to have the models be more effective. Um, and there are compute trends over time where as, as you scale the models, the performance gets better. Uh, there's also some debate going on about the uh, sort of maybe limit that we're going to hit at some point. Um, the two main limitations of computation, and I talk a little bit at the end about the environmental impact part, are the cost and resource in, uh, intensity of how expensive and, and, and how intense uh, these resources are to train these models, which makes it so that um, the, uh, the computational costs are unsustainable and inaccessible for organizations that don't have the resources. And uh, scalability is the other one. So, um, yeah, I don't. we don't know how much more we can scale given the current paradigm. Um, all right, if we're now done with the technical part, I'm going to move on to some history of the AI developments. Where are we? How did we get here? Uh, this is a really, really interesting graph. I really love our world and data. I would highly recommend everybody. This is a really great website. Uh, this just is to put into perspective how much technological progress has uh, impacted our uh, production as, as, as a species. So as you can see, uh, recent years, production rate has grown significantly. This has the implication that, um, you know, AI advancements could also further uh, catapult <laughs> uh, into a new period of unprecedented change, sort of the promise. This kind of figure is shown a lot in AI safety where we're trying to set some benchmarks to evaluate human 
level performance with AI. Here it looks at reading comprehension, image recognition. These are very specifically human abilities uh, before that we would uh, attribute. Now we see that uh, certain AI systems can match uh, human abilities across certain metrics. Uh, when we talk about AI capabilities, we really talk about two different kinds, um, general capabilities and, and narrow. And, and most AI models that we're seeing uh, are presumed to be uh, narrow AI capabilities. Um, those are things like image recognition or video uh, or chess. Um, and, and really what's important to point out here, this is a, a bit old of, an, of a representation, but it, it still holds. Uh, so these are two different algorithms, two, two exact same algorithms that were trained with a different amount of compute. And as you increase compute, it seems like the uh, quality of the images gets better. Uh, over time, we've also gotten really, really good video generation. We're at uh, sort of Sora is, is a really good thing to point to. You get hyper-realistic videos, um, really, really phenomenal stuff. And similarly with uh, image and video language, especially in the last couple of years, um, has improved significantly. Large language models, ChatGPT, they've sort of brought our attention to AI and uh, not just with language, they had some uh, side effects of training large text models. So they learned how to code and do math, uh, sort of as a side effect. And now we're seeing that uh, certain models, like this is a brand new statistics uh, with O1, which is the uh, newest model for OpenAI, that they can even meet uh, PhD level performance in science and math. Um, same uh, here, this is a Representation. These representations, especially certain benchmarks, uh, especially ones that come from the companies themselves, uh, should be taken with a grain of salt. But the general idea is that uh, at least across narrow capabilities, AI models are meeting human performance. This next one, uh, strategy games, is a really interesting one. I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, in, the, in the next part of why exactly that is. But around 10 years ago, Atari and Pong, uh, they're sort of like very rule-based, logic-based games. AI was capable of playing. Then we had uh, AlphaGo, uh, chess and Go games uh, that AI models were able to beat uh, human experts. And now we're seeing uh, strategy games like diplomacy where uh, the players have to sort of strategically withhold information and consider the other opponent's uh, psychology as a, as a result of it. The AI is able to also perform really well in those kinds of games. We'll hold the thought on that uh, for a second. And then something really, really important that I always try to point to in these kinds of conversations is how AI is helping in science, uh, especially a really good example. I think this will be a really historical example uh, is AlphaFold. Um, so one of the bigger problems of humanity, and those who are familiar with biology will, will know this a lot better than I do, um, is that we are biological creatures, and, and when we talk about AI, they're not. But as biological creatures, sort of the structure of the proteins that we're made up of and the, model, uh, and the modeling of those proteins, protein molecules, uh, have helped us really uh, sort of accelerate in scientific discovery with um, medicine and, and, and drugs. And we only knew a couple of them, so, so the Analogy is that it would take a PhD student around four years to come up with a protein molecule, the entire PhD dissertation. And with uh, AlphaFold, scientists at Google DeepMind were able to do it in under three minutes. Uh, it won the CASP 14 competition in 2021. And by 2022, all 200 uh, million protein structures were uh, sort of figured out because of machine learning and, and, and specifically AlphaFold. What's also super interesting about this is that uh, DeepMind has chosen to release that database of, of, of those proteins uh, to the scientific community. Uh, so it's, it's it's accessible and everybody gets to work on it. Uh, again, we're going to maybe talk about some implications of things like this. But the thing to really uh, note here is that for science, AlphaFold is projected to be just the tip of the iceberg. Um, this is a quote from Demis Hassabis. I attended one of, a, one of the presentations of this and, and he said, the promise was that you know AI could serve as sort of the description language for biology, similar to how mathematics is for physics. So from that perspective, we're at a really great optimistic point in scientific discovery because of uh, this intersection with AI. Some some uh, other exciting work, or you know, one with one of the biggest problems with uh, human biology is uh, antibiotic resistance. Um, there's a study I'll, I'll go over it very briefly where 
yeah, the machine learning model is going to help us with kind of figuring out this, uh, this problem. Uh, so when we look to the future, this is a quote from Sam Altman, everybody at this point knows who he is, uh, from the perspective of the companies that are trying to develop really capable AI systems. Uh, this is sort of an inev inevitable, uh, really optimistic future. Uh, assembly line work is going to come after legal documents and medical advice, which I always find funny here. Um, and in the decades after that, they're projecting that we'll have AI uh, extremely involved in scientific discovery, or they do it on their own, or that they'll even become uh, companions. So we really see uh, sort of this really optimistic future when you look at, looked at it from the perspective of the companies that are developing this. Scientific community is sort of uh, bent on the issue, as we as we showed earlier. There are even people who say there's a 5% chance of AI cause, uh, causing humans to go extinct. Again, these are very abstract figures. Um, it's just to show that there's sort of a range of perspectives here. And when we talk about uh, this human extinction level capable AI, we're really talking about not the narrow AI, but uh, things like AGI and ASI that the companies set as uh, benchmarks. So there's no really formal definition for these things. Uh, the companies have their own definitions and they change over time. But artificial general intelligence generally is uh, AI systems that can equal human performance and super intelligence is projected to exceed, uh, surpass human performance. Um, so a little bit of imagination is required to sort of think about this hypothetical future and what the implications of that are. But there are companies that are trying to develop this. A lot of investment is being made into um, trying to develop this kind of general purpose technology. And the problem there is that nobody really knows what to expect from a world where AGI and ASI exist. And we really don't know how to make it behave morally. Um, and that's where the field of AI safety comes in. Um, and yeah, so when we talk about AI safety, there's a couple different things we're talking about. Uh, there's four main areas. Uh, the first one is the short term effects of, of, of the current models that we have. Uh, and they, they can have accidental or, or misuse sort of side effects. So short term accidental, uh, an example would be like a self driving car, uh, have, getting in an accident. Uh, Short-term misuse is something like a misinformation, disinformation campaign. Um, and long-term accidents are things that the developers or the people who are making the decisions about AI um, haven't really anticipated something happening and it goes wrong. And and it's, it's really bad because we've already embedded them deep into our social system. So it's, it becomes a little bit more messy. And long-term misuse is when you have things like malicious actors. Um, most AI safety work uh, is done in the technical uh, aspect of it, which is very necessary, but um, so, some really important things to point out here are mechanistic interpretability. This is a field where a lot of developers and, and people who are really good at coding basically are trying to understand what happens inside the models better. The part where ethics and AI safety from maybe a socio-technical perspective are more uh, concerned with are Three, fairness and bias mitigation, uh, value alignment, and human AI collaboration. Value alignment is trying to see what values um, we embed into these systems and how we can do it so that they reflect what humanity wants. Turns out it's a very, very hard issue. It's sort of what the philosophers have been talking about since the beginning. Um, fairness and bias mitigation and human AI collaboration is really just trying to see how the interaction with uh, humans and AI are going to be. Um, some other technical things to point to, uh, this idea of a rogue AI, which is a misaligned AI, and I'm throwing out these words because, uh, you know, I, I don't have so much time to explain them, but basically when we talk about rogue AI or misaligned AI is uh, when the models behave in ways that the developers don't intend, and this can be done in a couple of uh, different ways, so proxy gaming and goal drift, the, the, here's a really good representation of that, so this is a, uh, a reward model was trained to play this game to complete the course, uh, but the developers uh, programmed it so that it gets points every time it gets one of these uh, green coins. And the model figured out that instead of playing the whole game, it could just sort of go in these circles and, and, and grab as many points as possible. It's not what the developers intended. The model kind of figured this little cheat code out. Um, but this is a very small scale representation of, of something going uh, wrong without the developers intending to. 
Now, power seeking and deception here, um, I kind of alluded to earlier with strategy games uh, in the beginning, but this is a really interesting <laughs> sort of research area. Uh, there's some research, this, this one's a pretty recent one, um, that shows that mo uh, models could actually withhold information in the training uh, process so that, um, like, I don't know, it underperforms for a variety of reasons. Uh, Models don't need to be aware or you know conscious or, or have actual understanding of tasks to do this. This could just be a byproduct of um, any anything that goes on in the layers. It's kind of analogous to how um, in 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 uh, there's a, there's a really good paper on this on, on how uh, in nature uh, deception is an emergent phenomena. Um, a really other good analogy that people use here are okay. We're talking about some future systems that potentially might exist that will have um, a big role to play in society. And we currently are in the position of this eight-year-old who have inherited a trillion dollar company, um, but we don't have anybody uh, who's going to sort of guide us on how to make this decision. So we want to hire somebody to help us. Uh, and there's really three different kinds of people we can hire. Saints are people who genuinely want us to uh, manage our estate properly and you know they have our long-term interests in mind sycophants are people who uh, will just do whatever it takes to make us happy in the short term uh, without really having a uh, regard for our long-term well-being a good example here is like if the eight-year-old were to go to disneyland and 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 sort of the supervisor would just let them spend the eight trillion or one trillion there um and schemers are the sort of deceptive ai agents that we're we're sort of worried about here um there you know, the analogy is that they would be people who have their own agendas uh, and and maybe in the beginning they'll act like saints but in the long term uh, pursue their own goals uh again there's a bunch of technical work that's being done to uh, understand this really overview analogy better but because of the shortcomings of systems and our lack of understanding of uh, of their decision making process there are a lot of associated risks that um on the non-technical side we need to worry about. A couple that I can point to are um, bioterrorism, <laughs> as, as we kind of have figured maybe in the biology example. Um, there's persuasive AIs. Uh, this is a bit more in line with my, my specific interest. I'll talk about them in a second. AI agents, um, AIs that are able to act with a lot more agency in the world, and this is really something uh, people are worried about, and a concentration of power. So um, a really good example of maybe something going wrong, uh, and this is a very small example again, as when the API was first released for um, uh, one of the versions of ChatGPT, uh, a model was <laughs> created called Chaos GPT, and it had the goal of destroying humanity. Um, and it was able to have a Twitter page and accumulated over 600 followers before it was eventually shut down. Again, this is like a very minor, um, instance but it kind of goes to show that before you de deploy a model you kind of have to have these uh, potential safety breaches in mind bioterrorism this is one uh, that has gotten a lot of international attention and for good reason because we had this global pandemic and then as a result of it you would figure that we would have a really good international cooperation system to mitigate such risks. Turns out that's not the case. Um, so we have a world that's really unprepared for another pandemic. Uh, and AI has the potential to um, increase sort of the barrier to entry into creating pandemics. Um, there was a really, really scary paper in 2022 that showed uh, where, yeah, an AI could be used to produce toxic molecules, uh, and the paper found over 40,000 potential chemical warfare agents. Um, and really this is because uh, using large language models, the barrier to entry <laughs> into biology could be lowered. People could have wet labs at home. So this is actually a genuine area of concern. Um, people who are interested in biology, I would highly, highly recommend. Uh, in our resources, we point to some, some ways to get involved there. Persuasive AIs, this one's really interesting. Um, so this is show ice. So ice, I don't know how exactly to pronounce it properly there, but uh, this is a Chinese, um, Microsoft China's product on WeChat. Uh, and this is WeChat bot that reportedly has over 650 million users. 
75% predominantly male in rural parts of China that don't have female counterparts. It's trained so that uh, the user gets quite hooked on it, uh, wants to talk to it. Uh, here are some really scary figures of people talking to it for 29 hours a day, talking on the phone to it with six hours. Um, and here, something important to keep in mind is uh, China has different policies uh, than the West about uh, data privacy. Um, and and, and that kind of data is really not secure. So if you have 650 million users and that data is probably acquired by the government, that's a lot of information. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe speak to that a bit more in the future, but there's a Western sort of uh, example of this with Replica also. Uh, so Replica had a, China, a, a chatbot that they didn't program to flirt or make any kind of sexual advances, but it learned that people liked when it did that. Uh, so when Replica's uh, creators figured that out, uh, that was a really big concern. And due to some privacy data issues with Italy, they turned off that feature um, without really anticipating the side effects, which were that a lot of people were left distressed because they felt their companions were uh, sort of taken from them. This is really interesting to think about because uh, if you're creating uh, AI companions, uh, you would have to think about like, who do you tell your deepest, darkest secrets to? It would be your friend or uh, your partner. And if people have that sort of relationship with chatbots, then the people who are making decisions about that have to consider that because uh, that could be a quite persuasive uh, agent to have. Um, and, and, and again, with the data privacy, uh, there is a global AI race. Um, this isn't something new. Uh, this has been going on because uh, AI has a lot of promise for military, um, also economic advantages, uh, has a lot of implications for cyber warfare current use of lethal autonom uh, autonomous weapons in, in, uh, we can see, and it sort of exasperates existing risks. Uh, AI doesn't create anything new here. It just mirrors uh, sort of geopolitical tensions. Uh, a lot could be said about this, especially from people who work in policy. There's really, really great work that's being done in this area, but definitely not enough uh, considering the risk there. Uh, on the more industry side, organizations uh, who are in charge of deploying, developing and deploying these models uh, have the responsibility of being highly reliable organizations. Um, and this sort of means, I mean, this is one example of a Swiss cheese model, uh, but it sort of means that you have to have a safety culture embedded within your company so that in instances where something goes wrong, those are caught. Um, this, I, I don't know if this is the case currently, uh, but definitely, definitely needs to be the standard. And yeah, the potentials of AI uh, creating risks, uh, we kind of talked a little bit, uh, but there's also existing risks that we don't really have uh, solutions to currently, which are just amplified by AI. Uh, discrimination, reducing social connection, uh, invasion of privacy, copyright infringement, worker exploitation, these are really big problems that, uh, yeah, with the potential future of AI just become a little bit more exasperated. And now in the next slide, I have to talk about the existential risks. I know this is where people sort of have the largest disagreement on. Uh, everything I see about this, I am always very skeptical. Here on the right was sort of my introduction to these kinds of risks. Uh, this is from a book called The Precipice by Toby Ord where he ranks different kinds of existential risks that humanity has. And it, to my surprise, ranked unaligned artificial intelligence higher than all other categories, which I would have assumed like climate change or nuclear war um, were to be sort of much, much more of a tangible risk. Um, and, and, and really major players uh, within the AI ecosystem believe that AI could be a risk. Uh, existential level risk to humanity. And that's really something worth taking seriously, at, at least to not deny it uh, immediately. I'm not saying everybody should go and work about, uh, worry and work on the existential risk of AI safety, but to just really be mindful of what the discussions there are and, and to try to take them seriously. Because when I first heard about this, I thought, okay, surely if it's really that big of a deal, a lot of investments should be made into making sure this is developed in a safe way. Uh, turns out that's not the case. Um, a lot of investments are being made in trillions to developing AI systems that are capable, more and more capable, and really pales in comparison the kinds of safety resources that we have. It's only a couple organizations, and again, it's a lot of money, but still a couple million uh, in comparison to the trillion. 
Uh, and it's not just in funding that there's an AI safety gap, it's really in the organizations themselves. Uh, this might be a bit outdated, these numbers might be a little bit different, but it still stands to highlight that um, th these are really large organizations and, and the safety teams are, are not that many people. Um, the safety teams are tasked with really, really difficult tasks like trying to anticipate future versions of the model, what kinds of safety implications those have. Uh, elicitation is a big one, so even the capabilities of current systems, all the ways that they can have safety breaches. Uh, so it's really a lot of work for five to 20 people within these large organizations to do, and definitely not on behalf of uh, humanity as a whole. Uh, there's a lot of non-technical work. Uh, these are all developers or researchers but really a lot of non-technical work needs to be done on uh, how AI is incorporated into society. Uh, legally, who is to blame when things go wrong? Accountability is a huge problem. Uh, on the policy end, social sciences, uh, governance, uh, there's a lot of really different opinions that need to have a stake in how decisions are made. Um, and very, very briefly, I'm going to get to talk about AI ethics before we really uh, get uh, to the end here. Uh, there's really so much to talk about, but the five main pillars that we talk about when we talk about AI ethics is the explainab explainability, fairness, transparency, privacy, and accountability of systems. Um, accountability, again, is a really, really important one. Recently, we had a bill in California that was rejected where the accountability would have fallen onto the developers uh, in the instance of a future potential powerful model going wrong. Uh, this is a uh, very disputed. Um, uh, privacy, and these are really, uh, people have a lot of different opinions across different borders on these issues. That's why sort of the ethics discussion is an important one to have. Um, I'm again briefly just going to touch on the environmental impact. This is, sustainability is a really, really big area for uh, AI compute when we talk about it. People who have a background in, in, in sustainability or environmental uh, science really need to focus on um, all these projected uh, resources that will be poured into uh, large, large data centers in the future. Um, intellectual property rights, this is a huge one that's going on currently. Uh, artists and authors don't have ownership of their work. There's a lot of lawsuits that are constantly coming up. Um, and yeah, so these are sort of some, some areas that we talk about when we talk about AI and ethics. Bias and discrimination, the quality of the data, who are the people uh, the data is representing, who makes the decisions. Uh, these are really, really important topics to consider. Um, and in the projected future where things go wrong, it's really because of a lack of attention on, on, on the safety issues that we touched on. However, on a positive note, um, Solving these coordination and control problems could lead to immense human benefits. So this is sort of the positive uh, promise of AI systems in the future, uh, advances of science and technology and human flourishing, health, uh, economic prosperity. These are um, really, really great things that ideally would start with the people who need it the most. Really, really great updates on AI governance. Definitely not enough, but uh, in the last couple of months have taken really great directions. So countries, especially major players, are starting to take uh, AI safety governance very seriously. There's um, been assembled an international network of AI safety institutes as a result of these uh, yeah, the summits and the bilateral meetings that go on. Um, the next one is going to be in France. There's one also of all of the institutes meeting in uh, San Francisco in November. The White House is taking it seriously. Um, they're partnering with industry uh, quite rigorously. Yashua Bengio, as he's the person sort of that is in charge of the report. Uh, there's they're taking really the issue as seriously, um, more seriously than before, but definitely not as seriously as it needs to be. And the EU AI Act is, uh, you know, sort of a way to represent the EU values of human rights and fundamental rights within uh, the paradigm of uh, artificial intelligence. And yeah, so that sort of should give a brief introduction to all of the different things we talk about when we talk about AI safety. Um, I actually think we're pretty good on time, so hopefully we'll have a bit of time for discussion. But before we end, I'd like to take another quick temperature check now that I've unloaded all of this uh, information onto you. Uh, are you more concerned? Uh, this is supposed to say one to five, please disregard. But uh, how concerned are you? having found out a bit more, hopefully, about the kind of work that's being done. 
or that needs to be done. Um, and more, you can give me an indication maybe. If... Well, it's already, well, there was one person, we had a two, so you've already cheered up one person, so <laughs> it's a pretty impressive to uh, give a presentation on AI safety and have people become more cheerful, but it still is dominated by responses of five and four, four remains the, um, or remains the most popular vote. So um, similar, but one cheerful person, maybe somebody who joined late or who you just really convinced. Sue. All right, so that's good to, because there was like one bad outcome of this that could have happened where we just lost everybody and nobody thinks this is real. So I'll, I'll take it, I'll take that one. Um, so yeah, we can compare the results, like you said here. Um, maybe look at the results of the new poll, or you can just skip it because I'd love to get to the discussion. Uh, I'd love to hear how you think you can contribute. So um, in the chat, maybe try to uh, brainstorm a bit about the different kinds of fields that you work in with your expertise. Uh, and really, if you're interested, there are a couple resources that I could point you towards. These are things that I have found very helpful in trying to wrap my head around AI safety. Um, SciHub is wonderful. It's Maury's uh, project where he open sources all of his um, resources. So you just go on the website. It's very easy to navigate. Uh, hopefully more work will be done there in the future. The two others I would highly, highly recommend are the courses from Blue Dot Impact and the one that I'm currently facilitating for the Center uh, for AI Safety. Uh, Blue Dot Impact basically puts together a curriculum where uh, they have AI alignment and governance. Uh, one is more technical, one is uh, really for policy. And they've open sourced their resources also, so you can find the curriculum. Um, and the Center for AI Safety, from a different approach, actually wrote a textbook. Uh, Dan Hendricks, who's the director, wrote a textbook. So you follow one sort of concise narrative uh, on AI safety, ethics, and society. Really, really great resources. Um, when Maury and I first met, I was uh, facilitating the Blue Dot Impact curriculum in a local level at my school, and and this was a 15-week course. So uh, we our project was to try to condense as much information as we could in one hour. But I really highly recommend people to have, if they have the time and the interest, to, to take one of these courses. Um, we've also compiled a list of our own resources uh, that we've taken from also the two existing resources that I just talked about. Uh, Jennifer should have in the chat sent to you a Google Forms. If you sign up here, we'll be able to email you uh, a quite large document of all of the resources so that uh, you don't have to go online and try to like uh, scrape everything yourself. We've put them together. Again, this presentation was just the tip of the iceberg. A lot of the other interesting stuff that goes on in this field are in the resources. Um, and, and the resources are a great way to sort of see where you want to take things further. Um, and with that being said, thank you so much for attending. We've made it to the end with a little bit of time to spare, so we should have some time for q and A. I'll return back to our session here, maybe even stop presenting so we can see each other. All right, hello, everybody. <laughs> um, all right, let me check the chat now. And uh, so we were going to moderate, but there's few enough people here, you know that, we could ask people to unmute and ask questions. Um, you had a couple from Adam Cranfield who was complimentary um, and asked if a company such as OpenAI created super intelligent AI, who should have access to it and should there be regulations around cost and access? Uh, Jennifer, if you also, if you wanna moderate, please jump in. Yeah, maybe we'll keep Jennifer muted just because we're in the same room and that never ever works out <laughs> for me. So, um, so okay. Adam's question, um, if a company such as OpenAI created super intelligent AI, who should have access to it and should there be regulations? Uh, this is a really great question. One thing I omitted from this presentation, just because that is really its own topic, is this debate between open and closed sourced AI. So who is going to be in charge of developing this technology and who will have access to it. The open source community believes that it shouldn't be one organization, it shouldn't be one country, it really should be a collective human effort. Um, and they even think that on the safety end that that's a really good way to uh, have a safety strategy is when you open source the problems and we can work together to solve them. Uh, 
it's quite an optimistic one. Again, I don't really have a, an opinion here to say one or the other, and I really would highly recommend people to look into this themselves. But the closed source side of the argument says, well, uh, an organization that is highly reliable, that is able to intervene when something goes wrong, maybe turn something off that uh, like we didn't want this feature, um, or really who do we blame when something goes wrong? If it's under one bridge, it, it will be one company. Um, but we don't really have an answer here and we definitely don't have a consensus uh, as far as I've seen uh, nationally or internationally on what to do about that. I'd love to hear your opinion, Adam, if you'd like to respond, uh, respond here. Don't mean to put you on the spot, but yeah. Um, time. Well, I haven't really got an answer. I think it's, um, I don't know, it's just it's just interesting times in terms of the, the breadth of viewpoints people have from all of this, uh, generative AI um, innovation is not really as transformative as people are saying to the other extreme, which is very prevalent that it's absolutely transformative in a very short space of time, which kind of implies a level of intelligence, certainly what um, Sam Altman will always cleverly imply in every single thing he says, that, you know, it's absolutely transformative in a short term, if it really comes to that, then yeah i mean everything changes doesn't it because especially if you can hook um that ai it, it, you know goes beyond just sort of providing some answers to some questions it's actually hooked into doing stuff which would be possible right and there'd be no there'd be no reason to that's the easy part is hooking it in to do stuff in the world um but yeah i think i feel i feel kind of torn between being kind of somewhat skeptical um about the, the the strongest claims for super intelligence in the short term but i think a lot of ai safety and the reg the big regulations the big kind of discussions about regulation are sort of aimed at that they're aimed at this idea of if you have something incredibly powerful um that's why it's sort of a lot targeted at the biggest the biggest models at the moment that's kind of what they're what they're thinking there's not a lot of regulation about people creating small LLMs, for example, and doing their own independent work. Yeah. On our end, we, as the AI and Ethics Society at our university, did a debate where we uh, got people to be on one end of the spectrum and the other and sort of switch their places. So they had to argue for the other perspective. And in the end, for what it's worth, closed sourced one. Uh, I don't know, do with that information what you will. There's a really a lot of debate on, on, on this subject, especially on the governance end of it, because how do you govern something that is open source? This is an open question. Uh, thank you, Adam. Didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Uh, Maury, would you like to? I was just going to answer a couple other questions, which I can answer uh, that Adam had asked if we could get a copy of the presentation and uh, Sue and Jennifer will be sending a follow up email that Eventbrite allows us to do. It will include a link to this recording that we're making today, as well as I think, Sue, you'd be happy to share your presentation. Yes. Is that Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then there was a comment from uh, Jeremy Atkins, which I can address uh, about having launched an AI ethics and compliance consultancy studying for the IAPP AI governance practitioner accreditation exam. Are there other accreditations exams that are becoming industry standard? Um, the uh, I'm on the Lord Mayor's, the Lord Mayor of London's uh, initiative on ethical AI, the steering group of that. And the focus of that has been to launch a couple of exams. Uh, the British Computer Society is launching some that are quite technically focused, and the Chartered Institute for Security and Investment (CISI) has an excellent exam that we launched just last year and has had six, seven thousand people take it, starting to spread to other countries. And so that's another one that may be of interest. Yeah, thank thank you for that. I'm just going back to the uh, previous comment that Adam made. I was on the vast data. Um, uh, Cosmos event yes, yesterday and the day before, and uh, their CEO and uh, Jensen Huang were discussing that um, they're now using AI models to make better AI. So AI is training AI. Uh, and of course, that then creates a, a virtuous loop, if, if you like. Um, so that kind of raised my hackles a little bit, uh, my, sp my spidey senses tingling that that's, you know, 
you need certain guardrails and safeguards in place that you've got that human in the loop still. Um, it doesn't go off and do a Cyberdyne systems or whatever, um, you know, and uh, and take over the world. But that that just felt like a bit of a, an interesting step. As I said, the you know the 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 the, the wheel c can't go and help reinvent better wheels, but AI can help, yeah, invent better AI, which I thought was an interesting concept. Yeah, thank you for uh, raising that point, Jamie, because that is a sort of debate that's going on. Um, I've alluded to like the beginning with the data, um, uh, AI generated data is not as good as human generated data. This is a concern. It sort of alludes to this like circular process, but mm -hmm. there are some cases where it is really good to have AI in the loop uh, where maybe human resources and labor aren't available, like reinforcement learning from human feedback. This is going to sound very paradoxical, but uh, the way that Anthropic, uh, for example, trains their models is based off of constitutional AI models, which are, uh, smaller agents that are trained on the principles of of what the uh, outputs ought to be and mm -hmm. and instead of having a human rate the responses and smaller ai model does that so uh, that's proven to be really effective it uh, sort of also helps catch all instances where humans maybe have uh, certain biases and have human error uh, but then again it paints this picture of uh well what, what kind of future are we heading to if humans are less and less involved in the decision making process of of training models, uh, really, really yeah. good point. Thank you, so thank you, Mary. That was useful there's, info. A, there's a question from Maxime Fazilo. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Where are we in terms of measuring environmental impact, such as resources for data centers, amount of water, and electricity? Um, sorry, you cut there for a second. Uh, where are we in terms of measuring environmental impact? There are. Um, really some really great researchers who are who are doing a lot of work in this field in our resources we've included them uh the numbers i've gotten are from one of the resources there but really this is something that uh a lot more research is, is always called uh, for um so i don't know exactly where we are in measuring the environmental impact it seems to me that every time i hear about it it's that uh people who do research on this are, are really really concerned um I've seen a lot recently. Uh, the big one people are talking about is energy. So while we're worried about climate change, we're seeing AI really drive up energy consumption. Uh, Sam Altman recently said, well, AI is going to solve the climate problem, but he hasn't quite, quite explained how that's going to happen. I think it's looking like it's going to be the opposite. And there are definitely water impacts and others as well. Um, I've got a, a, a bit of a background in the data center industry and, and there's a, a couple of things. One, you're right on the water side. A lot of the modern data centers are, are fully evaporative systems. And actually, with the, the potential move to liquid cooling, the older data centers might actually prove better for AI because they've got closed water loops. Um, the other aspect is, is that the three big hyperscalers have all gone very quiet on their um, uh, uh, net zero goals because the rise in AI has driven their numbers in the wrong direction. So, uh, and again, a lot of what they're reporting is based on some very glib PUE figures on their data centers. Uh, mm -hmm. And for those who don't know, PUE is, is the, um, uh, the, the power unit efficiency. So basically the amount of power needed to run and cool a server. Um, and you know anything below 1.3 is reasonable. A lot of the um, you know, Microsoft and Amazon claim 1.1, 1.05 PUE, but that's for a fully populated data center where every disk that's spinning is actually being used for something useful. Um, in reality, their data centers are probably running at a PUE of close to two. Um, but uh, so there's an awful lot of misinformation out there. PUE is a very blunt instrument. And the data center industry as a whole is mainly American based. And I work for an American one and trying to get them to do any kind of view on power consumption and things like that um, was very, very difficult. Now, some of them are waking up to it, but that, yeah, this is pre AI. Um, so now getting into this AI. And, and one of the things I always say is that, you know, as you go into a, an AI project, as well as the financial ROI, there needs to be an environmental and sustainability ROI. Yeah, is is the outcome of this project worth the 
the uh, you know, the money and the, uh, the the energy used to to achieve it. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, there's a couple more questions, um, Sue. I don't know if you're looking at these, but there's one from Quill S. Um, yeah. So I guess that kind of also connects to Jeremy's uh, point. I think people. Kyle, okay, so Kyle asks, um, there are concerns with uh, these kinds of reported numbers being inflated to um, maybe persuade people uh, unnecessarily uh, over, like the AI hype is definitely real. Um, is there some merit there? So when we think about it from a perspective of we have a limited amount of resources and how do we allocate these resources best? Uh, how can we justify allocating you know, millions of dollars into AI safety, uh, trillions into the development. Uh, and I think the way that we do it is if we can really stand behind um, the claims that we make about systems that we launch. So if we think that, uh, especially let's talk about like the existential risk side of it, that people are making claims that aren't really backed. We're talking about a hypothetical technology, AGI, ASI. Um, how much can we justify uh, investing in, in into preventing certain hypothetical risks when they might not even occur. Um, the way that I would weigh that question would be, um, you know, how how actually legitimate legitimate is the risk? Uh, the fact that it's being brought up by people who are really quite involved in the research, some who have no stake in the development, nothing to gain from it. Um, that's definitely some merit. Uh, when when we look for truth in society under any kind of field, we look for experts uh, and and the point where they have consensus. And it seems like there's no consensus on the future of AI safety. Um, I think we need to be very critical when we see figures that portray these large numbers. Uh, we need to be very critical when something is really against what we believe. But uh, being critical doesn't mean completely disregarding uh, the issue at hand. So that's why we're all here. Uh, we always can learn more about the subject. And if there's something that we feel like we can do, and I say we as as people with agency, then then we ought to do it uh, and not let other people decide um, what the future looks like. Uh, I'm gonna just jump in and say there's a CN Josh. Uh, thank you, CN has, uh, has chimed in uh, on Jeremy's point on energy consumption and also asked whether there will be a follow-up discussion. I would say we're very pleased with this discussion. I have seen Sue present before and her engaging presentation style is a reason why we decided to go ahead with this and she put in a tremendous amount of work here. Uh, I think we're likely to use the Learn Tech Meetup. We got a, a decent turnout today and I think we can, uh, we didn't market it that much. We could get a, a bigger, although I like this small group, but uh, we could get a, a bigger turn up, uh, turnout and you know, get Sue out there some more and also invite some other speakers on AI safety, which is what we've done in the past. Sue and I have already talked about where we would take this next. And I think there is one more question here from Andrea Cartwright, who both Sue and I know from Northeastern. So uh, maybe you could address Andrea's question. Yeah, Andrew, great to see you. She's really, really wonderful. We've had these kinds of discussions the whole year with her. It's uh, really great. And so she asked about um, privacy. Uh, one thing to note when um, we talk about privacy is different companies have different policies. So here, Andrew asks specifically about ChatGPT. Uh, I know that OpenAI doesn't have uh, a policy against uh, retaining data. Uh, so what they do, uh, most likely is they keep every input that you give them and use that to train the models further. Uh, I might be wrong about this, but that's sort of what I've seen. If you care about your privacy, Anthropic seems to have a 30-day policy where after 30 days they get rid of your data. Uh, this might not be important so much for me or you where we don't really ask them such sensitive issues. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be assumptions there. I'm not going to make assumptions. But if you're really working with sensitive uh, data, you work for the government, <laughs> you don't want people to have access to your data, then I really would be wary of using uh, OpenAI's model. Um, and, and I think it's really up to the responsibility of the people using it, which uh, is unfortunate. That's kind of just how things are at the moment. Uh, that's why having uh, standards for AI safety would be really um, important because then 
when you use any product that's produced, like let's say within the EU or the US, uh, you could trust that your data would be uh, protected. That's not the case currently. So I always, uh, you know, wave caution when, when using uh, private models um, because they're probably using your data to train <laughs> their models further. So we've, we've got to time um, and Thank you all for participating in this. Thank you in particular to Sue for the great work preparing this and a great job presenting it. We will, we do intend to follow on from these things. We've been running it as a meetup group, but we're going to probably move to another platform soon. Uh, Jennifer has put a link in the chat. If you specifically want to sign up to be contacted, uh, th this will also be, uh, future events will also be marketed uh, widely by me uh, on LinkedIn and also my company, LearnerShape, which is a ed tech and AI company. Uh, it will go out on our mailing list and we have a mailing list on our website at learnershape.com. So you're free, we, you're free to sign up there. You will see some other things, but we only do uh, a few emails a year. So you won't get a ton of stuff. So with that said, Sue, anything to say before we uh, call it to a close? Uh, no, no, uh, just a reminder about the Google Doc, uh, Google Form that we shared. That's where we'll pull the uh, list of people who want to access the resources. Because, Ariane, I know we didn't get to your question, but the answer is there somewhere in the resources. Um, so, yeah, it's a really good document. I would advise everybody to sign up just to receive that. And if we do have events in the future, that will be a way we can keep in touch with you. But, yeah, thank you, everybody, so much for joining and for Maury for putting this together. Uh, really, that, really that Google link uh, is in the chat, which will disappear when we end the call. So uh, we're going to leave it for another 30 seconds for you to find it. If you um, if you click on it, then you'll have access to the Google form. Uh, and again, on the bottom here. Oh, Jennifer also did. That's good. Thank so, you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And you'll hear from us with a follow up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.